were open. Wonderful. Can you hear me and see the slides? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction and having me here today. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm not so good at monitoring the chat with the <laughs> while presenting. So, you know, I will I will um, present, but if you have something pressing, just raise your hand or Nicole or Borska, if anyone can like help, um, I would be happy to take anything um, and make this as, as interactive as possible. But I know we'll definitely have time at the end um, for discussion. So either way. Um, and Nicole came last week to our DNI, our Implementation Science Initiative work, and presented some of the amazing work that she's doing um, with Greg and Borska and others um, on community engagement. So I'm happy to, to pay it back now again. This is really nice. Um, so today I am going to talk a little bit again about, I'm going to focus on sustainability and kind of weave through kind of how health equity has come um, into play and in really thinking about this work. Um, and I'm not going to focus so much um, in the weeds in terms of the findings of specific studies, but I think that because of kind of where you are in your career tra trajectory, I think it's useful to kind of hear about how I thought about building a program of research in this area, some of the challenges, some of the big picture <laughs> experiences, um, and how this kind of evolved over time. So um, that will be kind of my approach. And again, happy to, to kind of, you know, connect you to any of the specific findings to do a deeper dive on some of the studies as well. Um, so again, as Nicole said, um, in terms of kind of where I come to in this work, so my training was originally in community-based participatory research. Um, that was my master's degree. And my doctorate was working with Karen Emmons and um, did a lot of work on kind of social epidemiology. And, you know, I really focused my dissertation work on the role that racial discrimination played um, and shape, shaping inequities in cancer screening. And as I thought about building a kind of career and thinking about grants as I transitioned to a postdoc and faculty member, um, that's my dog. <laughs> Sorry, my kids are coming home, so it might be a little chaotic. Um, I, I realized that I was kind of getting further and further away as I was doing these kind of social epi studies um, from having any kind of real world impact and getting further away from the community engaged and community based participatory research. So um, I was really drawn to implementation science probably around 2010, 2009. Um, is when I started hearing about it and learning about it. Because again, it brought in these threads of community engagement, the opportunity to think about addressing health inequities and was much more applied. So again, I have training in kind of these other areas and then kind of later came to the area of implementation science as I was starting my faculty position. Um, in terms of the type of work that I do, again, um, I, I really, really strongly believe in the work that I do, which is largely community-based. Um, that in order to do implementation science work, including work on sustainability, it really requires that we're thinking about um, community engagement and health and equity, health equity in all of these kind of aspects of implementation science. So again, I'm going to be focusing specifically on sustainability, but a lot of the other work that I've done um, kind of has us think about ways we can do that in other areas of implementation science as well. Um, and again, um, just to kind of like set us up in terms of thinking about implementation science and sustainability, I think it's often not a surprise to me that we have challenges in sustaining our evidence-based interventions, because if we think about kind of historically where the field kind of thinks, in you know, in terms of where we often start or get engaged, often the evidence base has already been developed, right? And so it's important to reflect on kind of the nature of the evidence base, who was maybe involved or engaged in the development and evaluation, um, because often the populations we might be working with and trying to implement and sustain programs, those settings and populations, particularly if they experience structural barriers to care and health inequities, may not reflect a lot of those more well-resourced communities that might be reflected in those earlier effectiveness and efficacy studies. So for me, that is something that I struggle with in terms of, you know, I think it's a reason why we have challenges to sustainability. So it's important to think about that as well. I'm not going to talk about this today, but I do want to say 
that I think it's exciting that in the field of implementation science, people are starting to think about, wait, we can't just start with the evidence base as it is. And as implementation scientists, we have to be working much earlier along the continuum, right? In terms of developing that evidence base with the focus on equity and um, thinking about implementation and, and long-term sustainability. Um, and one, one piece we published just a couple weeks ago um, and implementation science was really thinking about these notions of revisiting some of the concepts of evidence in implementation science with a focus on um, partners and the audiences and um, equity. So um, I will draw you to that paper if that's something that you're interested in. Okay. So today, again, I'm going to give you an intro to sustainability and kind of um, how, what we're talking about when we say sustainability and implementation science. I'm going to give some examples from my work and kind of the journey that I've taken in this. And then I think that there are so many gaps and opportunities. So I think as you're thinking about your research program, you know, thinking about ways that you might um, be able to contribute to work in this area. So this group, I think, knows what implementation science is and what it seeks to do. So I'm not going to go into that. But I do think it's important for us to reflect on kind of where the focus in the field has been in implementation science. So, you know, most of our work has actually, when you look at the funded research, a lot of it has really been in the area of implementation, right? We make this distinction between dissemination as kind of, you know, that tailored communication and that widespread dissemination and efforts to you know, let people know about our evidence-based interventions. But a lot of our fo focus has been on implementation. How do we actually embed it in those real world settings? And again, often the time period or focus um, of that work is, is you know, maybe that first six months, that first year, right? So that is where we have tended to focus our work in implementation science. So where does sustainability fit in in that context? Any questions? I see a little bit of something in the chat. So I wasn't sure. Was there anything, any questions about that before I move on? I don't see anything oh, okay, right good. now, but I will try to see. Thank you so much for checking in. Thank you. Okay. So where does sustainability fit in? So if we think about our kind of traditional translational pipeline, which we know, um, you know, is very <laughs> theoretical in terms of how this actually works. And, you know, of course, with our hybrid designs, we're already often thinking about implementation, ideally, earlier along this continuum. But I do want to say you can see sustainment or sustainability, whatever, however you refer to it, is kind of tucked in there as that last stage. Um, and I think the truth is, um, whether we're talking about intervention research, whether we're talking about implementation science, we often rarely get to it, even if we propose it, you know, even if we're looking at something like reaim and we're including maintenance. Um, I think just methodologically and time wise, it often gets we often don't get to it right for a lot of um, important reasons. Um, and it's a real if you're talking about sustainability, it's often a real challenge um, to study. So again, um, when we think about the last 10 years um, in, in the field of implementation science, um, the field has been um, really lacking in terms of empirical work in this area. And we're starting to see that change. But I just want to say and recognize um, there's a lot of reasons why that's the case. Um, a couple places where, you know, you might think about sustainability in our frameworks, you know, sometimes it's kind of tucked in there as one potential outcome we might study. Um, you can see it here as, you know, in the Proctor model. And, you know, there have been frameworks, um, you know, Greg Aaron's work on EPIS, which includes a whole distinct sustainment phase, um, maintenance, you know, within the REAIM context. But again, um, as I mentioned, often we include it as part of this larger implementation continuum, um, and it usually isn't necessarily um, focused on as a priority in our work. And this has really been reflected by what's actually funded by NIH, disappointingly. Um, when, when they did an analysis of funded research studies, only 3% focused um, solely on sustainability. So again, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so we have really tried to make the case in our work that we can't really lump implementation and sustainability together. And that we really need to study sustainability as its own kind of domain or phase. And of course, there are probably factors that are similar and strategies that are similar for both. But again, really focusing on sustainability um, is, I think, essential in advancing our understanding of it. 
Um, so we did a paper, I think it was 2018, um, Shannon Wilty Sturman and, and Brittany Cooper. Um, and this was just such a fantastic career opportunity for me. If you ever have a chance to do one of the annual review of public health papers, it's really fabulous because you, um, you don't do a systematic review in terms of kind of reviewing the literature from a methodological perspective. And you can really do much more of kind of a scoping or narrative review in terms of you know, advancements and gaps. So we had the opportunity to write um, a paper like that about sustainability and implementation science. Um, and it was, it was very useful in terms of seeing the progress that it made and also the gaps. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of kind of what we noticed in terms of sustainability is that really there has been increasing agreement in terms of its conceptualization. Um, and I think we kind of make the argument in this piece that there are multiple indicators of sustainability. In some cases, it will relate to kind of the extent to which the program continues over time. You know, is there fidelity over time to the core elements or components of the program? But we also have to think about because it's over time, there may need to be adaptations, right? So often adaptation might be part of that in a planned way, sometimes unplanned. But again, it gets a little bit more complex. It also might reflect continued health impacts, continued health um, benefits, right? Whatever the original evidence base demonstrated, do those remain over time? Um, often people also think about it in terms of, um, you know, Larry Plink is, and has done some really cool work thinking about the continued networks and coalitions and partnerships that are in place and that are necessary for sustainment. So sometimes it's that network. Um, and, you know, historically, I think um, a lot of the focus for sustainability really focused on this notion of institutionalization. Um, the extent to which a program is kind of routinized or formalized, you know, maybe it's included as a budget line item, for example, or maybe staff roles are formalized within an institution. Um, and I think that can be one important indicator, but I think that there has been a way, a move kind of away from thinking about sustainability as only institutionalization, right? That it's not, on, that's not the only component of it. Um, and I think it's really consistent with this move away from thinking about sustainability as this static end game that we're, or goal that we're trying to reach and really recognizing that this is often dynamic um, and it's often kind of a dynamic process um, over time. So I just wanna note that those, these are often kind of some of the three or four key indicators to assess sustainability. Um, and this is really reflected in this kind of definition that was published a couple of years ago by uh, Sharon Strauss and Julia Moore and colleagues that reflect some of these notions in terms of kind of over time, continued delivery of the program, continued impact, but also this notion that it's not static, right? And that it might be appropriate and also important for the program to evolve or adapt to changing contexts and um, science and needs while still producing benefits. So I love that really comprehensive definition. Okay, so why do we care about sustainability? This again is just an area that I feel so passionately about. Um, and we know it is a challenge, no matter what setting or population or intervention you are working in, this is a common challenge that is very well documented. Um, Mary Ann Shire was a mentor of mine, and she was a real pioneer in the area of sustainability. She actually did her dissertation on sustainability in the 70s, so she was like light years ahead of, of us. Um, and she was also a program officer at uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And so she did a portfolio analysis of her funded health promo promotion programs. And she found um, that among them all, only about half, 40 to 60 percent of programs sustained at least one component one to six years after adoption. And again, you know, most of our programs are multi-level and have multi-components. So again, this just suggests what a challenge um, this can be. And again, empirically, a lot of research has kind of redocumented that, that, you know, anywhere from, you know, 30 to 60 percent are sustained. I think it's also really important when we think about um, why we need to have more accountability for sustainability for a lot of reasons relating, related to kind of engagement and accountability. So for one, I think that on the part of funders and the public and community partners, we're starting to hear a lot of kind of frustration and, um, you know, 
really questioning, you know, we've invested all this money, all this funding on intervention development and now implementation. But if there's not that sustainability of it, right, um, there is kind of a notion of, of that accountability of that investment, that lost investment. And if you've worked with frontline staff or providers or practitioners, you also know all the efforts that can go into implementation, right, in that first six months or year, all the time and resources. And then if that program is discontinued, you know, that can really create weariness and frustration um, among them. Um, and I think it has huge implications, particularly if we're doing any community engaged work. You know, again, if we are involving partners in intervention or implementation efforts that aren't sustained, it's not going to have just implications for our own work in partnerships, but it ha really has broader implications for kind of trust and trustworthiness of researchers and, and institutions. So I think um, it's critical um, that we're thinking about this and, and addressing it. And again, Enola Proctor and others have really identified this as it's a challenging issue to address, right? It's a complex one and, and one of our most significant um, research challenges. Any questions before I go on? I just wanted to mention, Rachel, I mean, this came up in our DNI course today. Mm -hmm. like, why, why all the focus on implementation? Why aren't we focusing on sustainability? <laughs> I know we need to convince the funders, right? I mean, I have some theories on that. We should chat. <laughs> I'm happy to chat about that. Yeah. I think part of it is the time period, right? Um, and it's like, you know, often people want to do this work prospectively and focus on that gap. And it can be hard. I mean, I'm dealing with this challenge right now and some of the work nationally with sustainability. It's hard to engage the sites that aren't sustained, right? Um, so, you know, I think that has been one of the challenges. And then I think the other challenge that I've experienced is it's really hard to get observational and, and um, you know, kind of prospective kinds of work like that funded by NIH. They want to take action, right? They want to test the strategies. And at least that review section has often kind of prioritize that. And I think the sustainability field just hasn't been there yet in terms of, of knowing enough about those determinants to be at the stage where they're, you know, testing some of those strategies. So yeah, it's a challenge. Foundations. <laughs> um, so I, I won't go into all this, but I do want to say, you know, when we did this review in um, 2018, it was interesting to see how scattered the literature was in terms of how people were defining sustainability. A lot of the work was rarely guided by conceptual frameworks. People were using all kinds of definitions. It was so interesting. People would ask and say, you know, they'd ask one person at a site, was this program sustained? Yes or no. So, right, you know, it's not capturing the extent to which it was sustained or any of the adaptations again, rarely prospective. And often, even if they were looking at it, it might be like maintenance at six months, right? So rarely captured that longer term sustainability. And that's such a challenge too. I mean, I think this is another challenge is sometimes there is that latency period to see impact, right? Um, so that's been kind of another challenge in terms of um, making the case uh, for for programs where the, where the impact might be more sustained and might be more delayed. Rachel, I have a quick question as yeah. we think about, you know, methodologically and just generally, yeah. when you think about sustainment or sustainability and the outcomes, what is reasonable to expect in terms of sustainment? Uh, you know, are you, uh, do you think it is good if they maintain the same level of effectiveness as the end? Is it good if they maintain half of it? I, I don't know if there is good literature around, you know, what, what is good sustainment? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Lisa Saldana and colleagues just published a study. I don't know if you saw that, where she did a review of um, the sustainment phase of the SIC, the stages of implementation and completion. And they used a very linear, strict fidelity definition, right? Where it was like the extent to which the sites were still sustained. And they saw very low rates. I mean, 10% and less, uh, a little higher for some that were um, not in the social service sector that were more clinical. but. Um, you know, it, it's tricky in terms of like what, again, you expect, and there's all that literature around this notion of kind of voltage drop that over time you would expect some of that, of the benefits to go down. But I'll talk in just a minute about, you know, David Chambers' work around not um, using those challenges and gaps as learning opportunities, right, to make adaptations and refinements. So that's where it gets messy over time. Because I, I mean, I personally don't believe that it's, 
it's reasonable or even necessarily beneficial for having that strict fidelity. But we still we don't know enough yet about the adaptation science, as you know, in terms of which ones matter for sustainability. So that's where it gets trickier. Um, so, you know, in terms of the literature, you know, Shannon Wilty Sturman has done some great work in this area. And again, she did a review that, you know, was very consistent with some of the work that Marianne Shire had done. You know, she found in her review of about 125 studies that only about half were looking at continued delivery of all the program components. And then about a quarter of these studies reported um, an impact on, you know, continued benefits or health outcomes. And this, to your point, Borzica, like less than half of those programs continued at high levels of fidelity. And this is actually what got her into a lot of her work on adaptation, right? Because she found that there was little information about the types of adaptations, which ones were continued or discontinued and why, and how those were made, and what the impact was um, on those. So again, I see sustainability and adaptation as really kind of hand in hand, going hand in hand in this. But I think we're still learning um, in terms of what that looks like and, you know, what counts as sustainability for that. Um, I really credit, you know, David Chambers and Russ Glasgow and Kurt Stange and, and colleagues in terms of really kind of shifting some of the thinking around sustainability away from this idea of, you know, we must meet this end goal of sustainability and we must have strict fidelity at all times as we're delivering the interventions and really thinking about much more dynamic notions of sustainability, really thinking about um, continued learning, ev evaluation, problem solving, and kind of the evolution of evidence-based interventions that need to happen potentially over time. You know, not these reactive ones, we didn't deliver this because we didn't have time, but actually learning about changing population needs, right? Changing context in terms of how it's delivered. Maybe it was in person and now it's online. Um, maybe something, you know, is no longer a priority for a population or no longer a gap, right? Um, or maybe it's about the scientific evidence changing. That's where a lot of my work has been as the mammography screening guidelines have changed over time. So again, a lot of those adaptations um, are actually make sense, right? And in some cases, it may even require de-implementation <laughs> as we think about this evolution of evidence-based interventions. So again, it's much more complex, but I love... I love this idea that, again, it, it is more a learning system approach to sustainability as opposed to like this, this end goal outcome we're trying to achieve. Um, what, what was really interesting too, like when we think about what matters for, you know, we think about determinants of implementation all the time. And again, the literature around the determinants of sustainability has been growing. But when we did that review, it was interesting to find that almost always there was this assumption that just funding matters for sustainability, right? And that funding funding is the only thing that predicts sustainability. And I think time, you know, we know that funding matters, of course, funding can support sustainability, but we often find that funding alone is not enough. And that in some cases, other factors might be able to compensate. So just like we think about, you know, CFER, you know, all the outer contextual factors, the inner contextual factors, the characteristics of the intervention and the practitioner or um, population characteristics, all those same multi-level factors come into play in terms of sustainability. And again, we're starting to build that evidence base around it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I also wanna say, before I get into some empirical examples, there is just amazing work by Doug Luke and his group at, at Washington University for a long time in this area. And their sustained tool.org website is amazing, as is Greg's EPIS framework website. Both of them have tremendous resources around sustainability. Um, planning for sustainability and strategies. Um, so I just want to note, I have I use this and I have used this as a measure, but I honestly use this with community and clinical partners also in planning for sustainability in a more informal way. They often complete it, use it as kind of a planning tool and kind of reflect, reflect almost anonymously or as a group on what some of the challenges and barriers are to sustainability that they might want to prioritize and focus on. So again, this is an amazing, amazing resource. There's also the clinical sustainability assessment tool, super helpful. So I do wanna flag, if you're thinking about planning for sustainability, this also gets at kind of the, some of the determinants of sustainability, which we'll talk about. This is a great resource. Okay, I'm gonna give some examples, but anything as I kind of set up that background in terms of what sustainability is and how we're thinking about it. Okay, so I'm going to 
give um, just a couple ex uh, some a couple examples just to help kind of ground this. Um, so there's very few long-term large prospective studies of sustainability. Um, one of my favorites is from Dave Bueller and colleagues. They did a large dissemination trial. I think it was, uh, I think the dissemination trial was 125 or 150 sites where they were trying to disseminate and implement a sun safety program um, at ski resorts <laughs> across the country. And they had kind of a more enhanced and a more basic plan. Um, and then they did a prospective follow-up of, um, of all the components of the program. I think there were eight components over time. It, it one to two year follow-up and then a five to seven year follow-up. And as you can see, don't pay too much attention to the different arms. But over time, right, even the, for the more enhanced strategy where there was more intensive organizational change, you can see it drops off a little bit. Fewer and fewer components are being delivered at that one to two year follow up. And then at the five to seven year mark, a lot of them have moved over or stopped um, delivering it altogether. So again, we see that prospectively over time, even in implementation science trials. And they did a nice evaluation and assessment of kind of what was going on there in terms of, of what, what happened in terms of that discontinuation of the program. Um, and again, they had modest sustainability, but again, a, a lot of variation. And, you know, one thing they found is that, you know, the communication had declined. There wasn't all the energy and support that you would initially have over uh, the program. And then the managers and the staff kind of, you know, weren't excited about it. But the biggest factor that really impacted sustainability was attrition and manager turnover. And we hear that time and time again. One of the strongest predictors and one of the strongest factors that shapes long-term sustainability is both organizational stability and staff attrition. Um, so really some level of kind of that organizational stability and infrastructure is essential. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's, it's very consistent with some of the, the research that I've done. So now I'm gonna tell you about some of the work that I've done on sustainability and how I um, kind of got there. So this is a picture of um, partners from the National Witness Project. This is us in, I think it was 2010. We had just gotten our first NCI grant funded together, a small RO, RO3. Um, and um, we had gone to Florida to have a conference and kind of kick off the, um, the study. So again, I completely credit the National Witness Project for bringing me to the field of, of to focus on sustainability. So we started partnering before um, because I was doing work on peer led programs, you know, and I was really interested because the peer led programs that were community developed that were addressing health inequities, I was really interested in understanding how to better support them. And as we were doing this work, um, they said, you know, we're happy to partner with you. You know, we can do some interviews, but you know, they had just lost half of their sites across the country during the economic downturn. They had developed in the early nineties. They had been at 40 sites across the country and they had lost half of them at, between 2008 and 2010. So they said, if we partner, we, we just wanna focus on issues of sustainability and how to better support and sustain the program. And they were also having huge issues with attrition. They were training lots of lay health advisors and, and losing a lot. So they, they wanted to understand how to better support them. So that is really, again, <laughs> what drove me to this work in implementation science. Um, so a little bit about this program, because I think it, it has implications for why it was sustained successfully for 30 years in the first place. Um, so this is, a, again, a lay health advisor program that was developed really by and for African-American women. It was developed in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, with an anthropologist in, in collaboration with an anthropologist. And it was really seeking to address a lot of the experiences of stigma and discrimination um, and racism that women, black women were experiencing and trying to access um, cancer screening services and really navigate the system. So again, this was very community-based. At the time, it was very uh, faith-based as well. And again, trained peers really kind of help navigate, educate, provide you know, support to social systems and social support. Um, and they're about half of the women themselves are cancer survivors. Um, and they provide these really powerful testimonials and narratives about how they navigated the system, how they spoke to their provider, um, how they overcame these challenges. So again, I think because it, ha it was developed by and for um, this group, I think it's part of the reason it has been so successful in terms of being sustained, because it, again, it's very community, 
uh, driven. And it addresses, I think, a tremendous gap. Um, so, so that's kind of the history of it. It's one of NCI's evidence-based cancer control programs, um, and it reaches 15,000 women per year. So again, um, they really helped come up with the, the study questions. Again, in terms of understanding for our RO3, a short grant, two years, what can you do on two years about sustainability? So we tried to make it achievable, you know, to, to kind of move the dialogue along in terms of understanding sustainability. So we were gonna look at the characteristics and capacity of lay health advisors, what kept them in the program and support their retention, and then understand broadly some of the, the factors that impacted sustainability at eight of the sites. So again, I'm not going to go into all the findings, but I, I just wanted to get, give you some little snippets of kind of some of the work that we did that laid the foundation for this larger grant that we have now. So first, when we would look to the literature, we could find nothing about lay health advisors themselves, who they were, you know, they're the, they're the key implementer, what brought them to, these, to this work, what kept them. We, we, we found so much information about the impact of lay health advisors, on women in the community, but we couldn't find anything about the lay health advisors themselves. So that was our first part, just to understand, you know, who are these women? What what's, what motivates them? What supports them? What are the challenges they receive? Um, this is the original group that developed the program um, in, in the early 90s. Um, and again, this is kind of um, our initial sites, our, the eight sites. So we um, interviewed and did surveys among 76 lay health advisors across these sites huge age range, 20 to 80, and huge range of uh, years of participation. Some were new and some had been involved for 16 years. So again, a very robust um, and engaged program. And what was interesting is they had a CDC trial in the early 2000s, about 10 years after it was developed. It was a national replication trial. Um, and so again, in some of the sites, they were community standing. Some of them were housed in cancer centers. There was a variety of, of ways that the site was kind of organizationally housed. So we did some work to kind of understand again, you know, who are these women? What do they bring to this? Um, and what are the benefits that they get out of this? What are, what are some of the challenges at kind of the individual level, the social network level, and the organizational level? What was interesting is we found um, kind of, you know, in their qualitative work that almost all of them came to this work because of their personal or familial experiences with cancer um, or their desire to address inequities in their community. But most of them said one of the key reasons they stayed in the program was the social network and the social support that they received uh, through the network of lay health advisors particularly for the cancer survivors, many who had recurrences or other health challenges while they were in the program. And a lot of them talked about how this was a stepping stone for them in terms of career advancement, um, skills, um, in terms of the empowerment and kind of ways that they brought this into their own community. Some of them went to school after, you know, as a result of being in this program. So again, a real sense of empowerment in being involved in this program. So our first step was to kind of identify, again, the kind of forms of capacity that the women bring to the program that might impact, again, their sustainability and their involvement in the program. So we published that to kind of capture who these implementers are. And then in implementation science, we published a piece where we kind of then, you know, we followed them up over about 18 months to 24 months. We had all this information from them at baseline. And we knew not all of those factors could matter in terms of attrition, which ones actually predicted whether or not they stayed in the program or not. So again, we looked at all these factors in kind of groupings of individual uh, factors, social factors, and role-related factors. And I thought the social factors were really going to matter the most because we had heard that um, in the qualitative. What we found, though, um, again, we followed them over time. We found that about a third of them dropped out at the end, which is pretty consistent with national literature um, in this area. What we found was the biggest predictor, hands down, was whether or not the lay health advisor was based at a site that had a strong um, and positive partnership with an academic center or a cancer center. They were 80% more likely to be involved um, and stay in the program at follow-up. And so we went back to say, you know, what's happening at these sites that are either housed within academic centers or cancer centers or, or have a strong partnership with it? And we found that these were more likely to provide a, you know, a higher stipend, 
um, have a steering committee where they could have voice, have physical space for the program, something that we often take advantage of, but is huge for community-based programs. Um, and they had regular trainings to provide kind of ongoing support and feedback. Um, and so for us, in terms of thinking about if we were to address this, one key sustainability strategy could be, you know, we often think about champions, but having both academic champions and community champions. Um, and what we're finding over time is that what those academic champions are doing is really addressing some of the funding gaps and infrastructure gaps that might exist. You know, a lot of these cancer screening programs get funding year to year. So when those gaps happen, the academic centers and the cancer centers are able to address some of those financial or resource or infrastructure gaps. So again, thinking about that partnership um, and those champions um, is, is critical. The other thing we found is that the longer time the women were in the program, the more likely they were to drop out. And we've heard a lot about issues of um, dropout and burnout um, among staff, particularly the smaller ones. And we heard a lot about the importance of not only financial incentives, but also social recognition, community recognition, recognition from leadership at their sites that this was valued. Um, so so that, that's kind of another potential sustainability strategy. And then we also um, heard a lot about and learned a lot about how those that had really clear role expectations were much more likely to remain. Those who were not clear what their role were, were more likely to drop out. So again, really highlighting the importance of kind of clarifying role expectations and really providing um, some of that information at trainings and giving people the opportunity to receive kind of feedback and support um, through, through trainings. We often think about training as a, an implementation strategy, but it's always almost essential as well for sustainability, again, to provide that ongoing feedback and support, which we heard was so important to them. So again, it wasn't only the skills in terms of the knowledge, but that those connections with the other women. And then finally, I won't go into too much detail with this, we also did some qualitative in-depth work to really unpack what was actually happening there with all of these factors. So again, we, th we focused a lot on these, you know, the policy and the funding environment, the organizational setting, the processes, the interventions, and the, the intervention. And I want to say we did not find a lot of variability in these bottom two. You know, all of them said they received tremendous benefits from the program. All of them thought this addressed an important need. Where we see the biggest variability across sites that are sustained and non-sustained are in these outer contextual factors and inner contextual factors. That's where the variation was happening. And so again, I'm not going to go into detail. This is published in Translational Behavioral Medicine, but the qualitative really helped us operationalize the, uh, operationalize the processes, right? If we knew that these partnerships with community-based and academic organizations and cancer centers were important, this really provided insight into how they were accessing and navigating those relationships and resources. So again, everything from facilitating access to low-cost screening, to referrals, to support groups, to providing access to, again, things we take it for granted you know, of in terms of space, having access to a printer. Um, we learned a lot about the external funding availability and how um, we really disadvantage community groups with the way that we provide short-term <laughs> um, funding. And, and this instability of funding, the short-term funding, makes it challenging to sustain a program. Um, we also heard, it's been very interesting to see, at the start of, um, you know, 2010, that whole period, there was probably eight of the 16 sites were based in an academic center or had a, you know, or were basically housed in it. Over the past 12 years, every single site, all 16 of the 16 sites, only one has remained physically housed at an academic center um, or a cancer center. And particularly pre-COVID, we heard a, a real lack of value and a real lack of prioritization of both um, screening mammography programs and equity focused programs. So almost all of them have moved out independently and they might still maintain those resources and those relationships, but organizationally did not feel like they were valued being housed with them. So very interesting in terms of kind of how these partnerships have evolved over time. And again, we learned much more about you know, we, again, we often hear about program champions, but we learned a lot about how the champions and the project directors were operating to access and navigate resources and funding. 
Um, and so much about how they were essential to, in terms of providing the support to the staff, to the lay health advisors that impacted their retention. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. So again, we know this in implementation science, but for us, this was really helpful to use the qualitative and the qual quantitative to kind of piece together all these barriers to sustainability, these multiple levels, all these facilitators. And we then published this um, Lay Health Advisor Sustainability Framework of, again, what we had learned. Um, and again, we know that not all of these things um, matter. So we then, after a whole lot of trying and failed grant attempts at NIH, <laughs> again, Greg, to the point of um, not them not wanting to fund observational studies, um, thankfully, um, American Cancer Society funded this almost right away. I think I think it was um, within a year of submission. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, and this is a national study um, where we are now looking at and testing this model using mixed methods to look at which of these factors actually end up predicting sustainability across the four years. So we have a sample of 200 lay health advisors. Um, we have about 16 project directors and sites. So we're using a comparative case study approach where we're looking at over time, which sites are higher sustained, moderate sustained, lower sustained, and using again, some of that qualitative research to understand those differences. We're using an adapted version of the PSAT, which, and as well as a measure that I have been piloting um, as a, for a survey to look at determinants that capture all of these aspects annually um, and which end up um, impacting um, sustainability. Um, and one of the most interesting pieces to, of this to me has been this issue of adaptation, because again, the screening guidelines are completely different from what they were when the program was originally developed. And understanding the extent to which programs adapt or not um, to the new guidelines has been fascinating, and I can share a bit about that. Um, so again, that's kind of where we are in our fourth year, sadly. Um, so this is how we're operationalizing some of our sustainability outcomes. So again, this is always a balance of like ideal rigor versus like what's actually feasible, at, you know, for 16 sites nationally that are community based. Um, we had big plans of doing ethnography where we would observe and fidelity checklists and adaptation, but that was not feasible, especially amidst COVID in the last couple of years. So we are defining this as um, continued delivery over time. We're looking at the number of educational sessions conducted per year, and that tends to be the most robust metric for this program in terms of capturing sustainability. We're looking at also at infrastructure to deliver the program, the number of lay health advisors and staff who are active, and the total number of those who are active and those who drop out. And we're looking at the continued health impact by looking at the number of women reached and screened. It was, many of them are not able to capture the data on um, the mammography itself, which is a challenge. We also looked at institutionalization, some of the validated measures um, from that. Um, and we also looked at, there's a measure that I think it was Larry Palinkas that had developed on self-reported sustainability that we're looking at. So all five indicators. And what has been so fascinating has been Many of these sites um, nationally are the ones that we had partnered with already in 2010. So for many of them, we have data over time from 2013, 2014, some of them even earlier. Um, so you can just see kind of map, we've been mapping out um, all of the sites in terms of their activity levels, you know, from 2014, and, and we'll be doing this through 2023 to look at and understand those patterns. And it's interesting, the sites that, you know, tend to be active and sustained um, tend to be those same ones, but there's a lot of variability. Some of the sites have gone from highly active to moderate to not and back again. So it's much more, it's, it's much more dynamic than I had ever imagined in terms of capturing what, you know, what is a sustained site. So I think it's important to note that, but we tend to see these groupings. You can see kind of the moderate sustained in the middle the low sustained and the, the blue is the high sustained in terms of number of programs. And then again, similarly with the, num with the staffing, we're kind of looking at that over time too in terms of how that maps onto activity level. Um, and what we're tending to find across this now like 10 to 12 years of work, half of it funded, half of it non-funded, um, what we're seeing again really um, stick out is um, the continued organizational resources and support and valuing of the program tends to be, again, a huge factor that is predicting the, the stronger sustained sites. 
the sustained relationships and partnerships. And again, that's both with the funders and with the, the resources they're able to access through the academic partners. And then particularly amidst COVID, we have seen that adaptation and changing amidst kind of changing needs, changing contexts is, is um, just tremendously important. I mean, doing a study on sustainability during COVID has been very eye-opening in terms of how they have adapted and pivoted um, or not. Because you, as you might imagine, for a lot of these women, cancer screening was not a priority um, in these last couple of years. So again, that piece we're, we're really trying to understand as well. I'm not gonna go too much into this, but I do wanna say one of the biggest lessons for me has been the importance of returning the data. So this past summer, um, we brought on some students and we had the students create tailored reports. Um, and you know, we asked them, do you want kind of a high level summary or do you want all the data? And all the sites wanted all the data. And so we have now described across all the years, we have handed them reports on what What's happening at your site? Again, it's summary, it's anonymous. What's happening nationally? And we return, we meet with them, we talk about it, we ask them like, this is what we're starting to see. Does this make sense? What are we missing? And I think to me, that has been the biggest game changer for them in terms of sustainability because they're now using that information to inform grant local grants. They're using that to report back to funders. So I think that's something that I did not realize the value of that data for them in terms of returning that. So that's been an important part of kind of what we've done. And again, if we think about sustainability in the midst of, of COVID, again, it when we look at some of the challenges they were reporting in 2018, 2019, right before COVID, again, a lot of it related to funding, staff turnover, organizational resources, et cetera. Look at it now with, you know, this was last year during COVID. Again, 76% reporting the biggest challenge was COVID and then all these other ones. So again, as we finish our, we're doing our final round of data collection and a lot of them are still in a really tough place. Um, so I think it will be, it will be an opportunity for them to think about how, a lot of them are thinking about how they're adapting to address other community needs. So again, stay tuned on how that evolves. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I think one of the most interesting and most important findings that we're starting to, to really learn about and think about is this issue of, again, adaptation over time in the context of sustainability, and in some cases, um, de-implementation, right, which is a huge area in implementation science. So we had a fancy measure, I think it was Masadi, where we looked at all the organizational multi-level factors um, that would predict potentially uh, whether or not they were adapting and whether or not they were de-implementing. Um, and if they were kind of you know, changing the age and the interval at which they were screening, and if they were removing breast self-exam, which is no longer recommended as part of clinical practice, but is a huge part of the program. And what we found is that the number one reason why most of them said that they are not adapting to the new guidelines really, really related to issues of um, historical mistrust of the guidelines. And we heard a lot about, and this is completely true, the, the, the screening data and the trials that have informed um, mammography guidelines have not reflected the experience of black women, right? And so they, they recognize that they are at greater risk. They have more aggressive tumors at younger ages. Um, so, so they have really advocated for keeping it at 40 and doing annual screening, which is inconsistent with US Preventive Service Task Force, but is consistent with a lot, you know, with ACS and other guidelines. And they have really, really felt strongly about keeping breast self-exam. Um, and again, the data on breast self-exam, you know, suggests it's not associated with mortality, but they argue that particularly for African-American women, it's a critical empowerment and kind of decision-making tool um, to be comfortable with changes in their body. Um, and they're not using it as a screening modality, but as really an empowerment and an education and self-awareness modality. So it was interesting, NCI actually had them um, include a justification for keeping it um, on the evidence-based cancer control program. And um, that has been it's been a very important part of the program. So it's been interesting to see how they've navigated that. Um, and for me, it just, it just you know, reminds me of how much we have to contextualize and think about um, you know, as new guidelines and um, adaptations roll out, um, how much does that evidence, again, reflect the communities in which we're working? Um, and thinking about that framing in terms of who's delivering that, that messaging. So again, 
that to me has been some really important findings that they've highlighted through the qualitative work. Um, and again, this is a paper we did um, about a year and a half ago on this issue of kind of trust and mistrust as we think about adaptation and, and de-implementation. Okay, any questions as I get into kind of wrapping up big picture sustainability? Anything about what I presented in terms of those findings? Rachel, this is Nicole. Can you can you hear me? I had to switch devices and I don't have a, yeah. a webcam on this one. Yeah. I, just, um, I was curious if, um, you know, based on the two observational studies that you shared with us about the lay health advisors, are you thinking a next step might be to try to package those into testable sustainment strategies? You learned so much. Yes. And, okay. <laughs> I love it. So it's so interesting because it was this really interesting tension as we gave all the data back the last couple of years, they were like, we want to do something about it, you know, and, you know, can, we want to take action. And of course, so some of them probably will take action, to be honest, um, in, in addressing these things. Like one, one lesson learned from that first trial was that the training mattered. So they instituted the national booster training as a result of that finding. So they are all about translating these findings into, into change. So this last round of data, we came together, we met with the groups, the project directors, we presented all the data, and we came up with a range of sustainability strategies. And so right now we're collecting data on their perceptions. We, you know, we thought about the appease criteria, that was way too much. We thought, so now we're just looking at, do you think this will work? And do you think this is doable at your site? Um, so we have a list of about, oh, we have a lot, 20 to 30 strategies, sustain, potential sustainability strategies. Um, and so that will really inform our next steps in terms of really trying to actively address it. And I think for me, one of my biggest lessons learned is just like with any implementation science work, like it is not one size fits all at these sites, right? They are all in very different places in terms of capacity and leadership and, and resources. And so, you know, it may be that there's kind of like a package of sustainability strategies and then they might be tailored, you know, some sites that are further along might need less and some might need more. So um, I think it'll be kind of like some adaptive strategies in a sense. So I'm so excited about learning more about that. Thanks, me too. <laughs> I think Susan has a comment. Yeah, I had a question. Um, uh, yeah. Do the lay health um, advisors um, do other cancer uh, recommendations like for colon cancer? Because what I'm always curious about is that in breast cancer, the guidelines have gone towards reducing amount of screening, but for colon cancer, we're actually, the guidelines have gone to making more screening recommendations. And so I was curious if the trust mistrust was over the, the variability or the fact that you're taking something away. And so was there any mm -hmm. different response to the colon cancer screenings where you're telling them to get screened more and so I'm trying to figure, I just was, because people don't like things being taken away. Yes. Right. So, so yeah, so that's just like a natural instinct, right? So if you add a guideline yeah. uh, in Poland, are people like, yeah, I'll do that. Or are they, oh, these guys don't know what the hell they're talking about because they keep changing it. That's interesting. So most of the sites started as breast and cervical, right? They started as like breast self-exam, mammography, pap. Um, it is interesting and something we're going to look at. So we have a lot of data on adaptations that each site has made in terms of additional topics, because we want to understand, are they expanding and does that then help in terms of their sustainability? And I think that is the case. So there are several sites and mostly the sites that are more sustained that have added uh, education around HPV vaccination, colon cancer screening, just like you're saying, yeah. And so I think I think the issue of the breast cancer uh, screening might be a little specific because it is get screened less, take away this breast self exam that we value and that we communicate as part of a foundation of our program and um, get screening at older ages. Because again, they know that black women get, get diagnosed with more aggressive tumors at younger ages. So it just doesn't reflect their lived experience. We have less data, so they have, um, they actually partnered with an insurance company around some of the work on um, colon cancer screening. And so that's been a pilot at three of the sites. So um, we'll see if they do a national rollout of that. I don't think all of them will have the capacity, but I don't know that there'll be the same issues around. Um, it'll be interesting, I don't know. Because it's an addition versus something that they, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so I'll go into some of the kind of opportunities, gaps, exciting things to think about. Um, so one thing I will say is I do think this area is kind of wide open because again, <laughs> Um, there's been real challenges in getting this funded. There's a real need for empirical work. And I think we're finally at the place in the field, you know, where we are in some agreement about what sustainability is. We start that we now have some frameworks and measures which I can talk about that can at least help guide some of the work. So there can be a little bit more replication and consistency in terms of how we're thinking about it, right? And I think, again, ideally, as we build this evidence on the determinants, we can start to move towards testing some of those strategies. Um, so one thing we did in that annual review paper with Shannon and, and Brittany was um, we reviewed um, about 250 articles at the time. It was around 2008 or a little before 2018. Um, of, and we tried to kind of empirically look at across a range of types of settings, school, global, whole systems, community, public health. Are there some commonalities in terms of the factors we're seeing that tend to matter? And so we kind of put forth this idea of the integrated sustainability framework as maybe a starting place that people could work from and refine in their specific setting or population or health issue, um, but, but just as kind of an empirically driven um, model. So that's in the annual review of public health piece. Also in that piece, we organized our findings by the different types of settings. So again, community, school, clinical, global, systems, et cetera. And we tried to identify where there started to be emerging evidence in terms of which factors might matter for which settings or do some factors matter more for certain settings. And I think that's where the literature is starting to kind of evolve. So you'll see articles, for example, on sustainability determinants in school settings or global settings. So again, similar to a lot of the implementation science research, the setting has often um, been the focus. And there are starting to be some consistent findings. Again, in a lot of settings that have a really strong organizational basis, whether it's schools or clinics, we know, again, that issues of attrition and organization, organizational stability really matter. Um, there's been some great work. Juliet's done a really amazing review on sustainability um, in community settings in Sub-Saharan Africa with 40 papers. And one of her, you know, really key findings was that the biggest predictor of sustainability really related to the extent to whether or not there was community engagement early and often and um, an adaptation early in that process. And that there was also recognition of kind of the broader political and social context in which it was happening. So again, we're starting to learn a little bit about which factors might matter. And again, um, I've worked a lot with um, the group in Newcastle and Australia. They are doing some really amazing trials at large ones, you know, 150 schools or more um, to really understand sustainability of policies, physical activity policies. So they've done some great work if you're interested in that. And they continue, they're doing a lot of work on sustainability strategies as well. Um, one thing that people, I just love this piece and it didn't get a lot of traction. It was written by Marianne Shire and AJPH in 2013, but she really put forth you know, some really interesting ideas that, you know, the type of intervention um, might really influence the factors that matter for sustainability, right? Those that are digital versus those that relate to partnerships or coalitions or those that require individual provider delivered interventions versus those that, you know, are require coordination among staff. So I think this has been really untested, um, but I think could be an important area for future work as well. So not just thinking about the setting, but kind of the nature of the intervention. There are so many unanswered questions. Again, I think about this, Byron Powell and I talk a lot, <laughs> he bugs me, about whether or not the same factors that influence implementation matter for sustainability. We've had a lot of discussions about this. Are they the same? Are they different? Again, with an equity, thinking about issues of health equity, are there certain factors that might be particularly important um, in lower resource settings? Uh, Lauren Hodge and colleagues have um, done a review on that. You know, are all factors equally important? Can some compensate for others, et cetera? And a huge question we haven't looked at at all, and which I almost always um, get asked every any time I present in a health system, <laughs> is the return on investment and value of sustainability. So again, we have a lot, a lot of gaps. Um, and one thing I'll say. Um, 
that I think is um, interesting with respect to kind of the overlap between implementation and sustainability. I mean, I think a lot of the organizational factors, right? Things like leadership, again, organizational stability, champions, you know, the funding context. A lot of those are going to organizational readiness. A lot of those are going to matter for both implementation and sustainability. But there might be others that are specific to sustainability, right? So thinking about again those issues of what happens over time, the extent to which programs um, adapt or not, again to changing contexts and changing needs. You know the extent to which there might be leadership turnover and a whole new set of priorities um, emerges. Whether or not um, the program over time still aligns with what's happening in kind of the policy and regulatory um, environment and all the issues around attrition. So again, there's probably some overlap, but probably also some specific factors. Um, some things that I often get a lot of questions about, if I were to think about this in my work, you know, what would you, what would you recommend? And so I always think, you know, first of all, just thinking about how you're defining what you're trying to sustain, what counts as sustainability. And again, ideally you're not doing this in, in isolation, but you're working with stakeholders um, around what's priorities for them and what's, what's feasible. Um, I don't think there's a set time period for assessing sustainability. I've always made the case that to me, six months is not really capturing sustainability. I think ideally it's kind of one year out, two year out, two years out um, and, and longer. Um, but again, you know, um, what is feasible and doable um, in the work that you're doing. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to kind of um, understand and plan for sustainability. Again, we can't think about it as that last phase and hope to do it well. So we have to be thinking about and assessing some of these factors, just like we do with implementation. So again, you know, I mentioned some of the frameworks that we can use, and I'll talk about the REAIM extension that um, we have proposed to kind of think about this um, for some of our implementation indicators as well. And then of course, as Nicole mentioned, so much opportunity to think about matching those determinants we learn about to those strategies. Um, I've been working with Byron and the Australia group to think about the, the air taxonomy and you know where might these strategies um, be the same for sustainability and where might we need to add new ones. So again, um, stay tuned for some work in that area. I also think one thing that's so tricky is, you know, when I started this work, I was like, oh, it's just continued delivery with Fidelity, you know, and now it's like, well, it's continued delivery, but it's also the adaptation over time and it might be de-implementation and all, you know, so again, it's complex. And I think Borsica had asked at the beginning about that of like, what's the metric? And I think you have to kind of land on one in the context of your study and decide, you know, what you're going to agree on. But I think it's important to recognize that um, it's not as simple as it is in the context of implementation often. Um, one tool that we have put forth in thinking about sustainability is kind of an extension of the REAIM um, framework that again kind of moves beyond just thinking about the maintenance phase as being sustainability. So um, we kind of up made the proposition that we could think about maintenance um, as a much longer term um, phase and think about sustainability again across all the REAIM dimensions. Again, not waiting till we get to maintenance. So really thinking about kind of iterative application of REAIM and to understand where are there challenges and gaps that are emerging because that will have implications for sustainability. So really, again, just like we talk about in the dynamic sustainability framework, thinking about that through the application um, of the, the REAIM measure. And so this paper goes a lot more into that. Um, but just as an example, so we're doing this right now with the ISC3 um, pen trial where we're, again, trying to just be really transparent about when and where the challenges are happening. And again, not just in the maintenance phase, but all along, right? So we're thinking about when and where are the, you know, the inequities arising in terms of which settings are adopting and not, which has implications for sustainability. For reach, in terms of who's reached um, and not. In terms of implementation, which settings and populations and providers are um, implementing um, fully. Um, and not and why um, for efficacy in terms of the impact and then in terms of, of maintenance. So again, really identifying when and where these inequities are arising along the implementation continuum and these indicators with the goal of being able to kind of address this ideally um, and promote sustainability. So again, this is um, published in Frontiers and in this paper, we kind of, again, 
define what these different re -aim dimensions could look like with a greater focus on equ health equity and sustainability. So I won't go too much into that, but that is all in the paper. And um, again, in this ISC3 um, trial at Penn, we're really trying to apply this across a couple different um, studies where they're testing different um, patient and provider nudges informed by behavioral economics. Um, different combinations of them. And again, we're using the REAIM extension to track over time what's happening in terms of the settings um, and the populations where, where reach and implementation is happening or not and why. And then in this next phase, we'll, we'll really try and address that to try and um, promote sustainability. So this is kind of an example of where we're starting to apply this. We also in this paper um, include uh, hypotheses that we could test to kind of guide some of our um, work on sustainability. And a lot of these, again, really think about these notions of dynamic adaptation um, and sustainability over time. So again, this is all in that paper, but encourage you to take a look um, if you're doing work in this space. And then to Nicole's point about the sustainability strategies, I love Maji Halamariam's um, work. She's at Michigan. She um, did just a, a wonderful review on um, what are sustainability strategies, what are examples of them. Um, some of them are listed here. So again, often it's a bit of a distinction from implementation, but might be overlap. You know, the maintenance of, of workforce skills, booster training, system adaptation, continued support of leadership, planning for staff attrition and turnover, focusing on implementation teams versus individuals. So again, um, these are some examples of sustainability strategies, and I'm excited about I'm excited about the work that will come from this. Lastly, last but not least, there is just <laughs> so much that's come out recently with sustainment measures, which I think is super exciting. So, um, you know, Joanna Mullen and Greg and others did a wonderful review on pragmatic measurement of sustainment. Um, Larry's um, published and um, come up with measures. Um, there's the, the stages of implementation and completion, Lisa's work. And then, um, of course, um, one of the strongest measures we have is PRESS, the Provider Report of Sustainment Scale um, that, again, um, Joanna and, and Greg and others have been involved with. And um, stay tuned. There's a lot. <laughs> I, I feel like every time I have a conversation with someone, they're talking about a measure on sustainability. So I think there's going to be a lot of growth in this area, but right now it has been a, a tremendous um, challenge because there haven't been a lot of validated measures either in terms of the determinants um, or, the, or the outcomes. I also think one really important area, we don't talk about this enough. Um, I know Doug Luke and others have done some work, but um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for thinking about modeling some of the system science, you know, system science and thinking about um, some of that network modeling um, and kind of planning for and understanding um, sustainability. So again, not a lot of work in this area, but I think this is an important um, opportunity. Okay. And then I just put a piece, again, I talked specifically about sustainability and I've tried to weave in where equity has come in, but um, again, um, the other work I'm doing in this area um, talks about this specifically from kind of an anti-racism approach, how we might approach um, different elements of our work and implementation science. So this piece came out and I'm always happy to chat more about that another time. Last shout out to the National Witness Project. This was the Harlem site. I think the last time, sadly, we got together in 2018. So I want to thank them again. And I'm so excited. We just got invited to the National Academy of Medicine to co-present with a community partner. I don't know. I have not seen that. So I'm so thrilled and, and so honored that they um, extended that invitation to them as well. So that's coming up. And I want to just thank uh, collaborators and some of the funding that I've received. Thank you. And I'm happy to share slides. Um, follow up. It's a lot of information. <laughs> really, really wonderful work. Uh, so it's really, I'm, as you were talking, I'm just going, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Well, you've been one of the few people I feel like who has pioneered this work. Like there's not many people who have published or thought about it. And I feel like that's been a thread in your work. So yes. yeah. Definitely. I mean, we have state and countywide examples 
of our implementation studies where they've sustained for almost 10 years. Wow. And I'm thinking as you know, you're talking, oh, we need to go back. Like we've done some work on sustainment in those systems, but this is sort of making me enthusiastic about relooking and seeing what we can glean from that as well. But it, you know, I mean, a lot of it has to do with engagement and this idea of, um, I put in the chat, you know, we think of intentions at the provider level, but going into an implementation project, what are the long-term intentions of yeah. policymakers, of system leaders, of organization leaders? And I think, you know, just anecdotally, we've seen, you know, if, if we're implementing, for example, motivational interviewing, you know, sometimes the intentions of the organizations is, hey, we can get some free training in MI. You know, our goal is to have that really embedded, but, you know, that alignment of goals around, you know, long-term sustainment and quality improvement, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we align that with organizations? How do we motivate, um, you know, our, our collaborators towards that long-term sustainment piece? How do we make that like a really important goal? Without scaring them up front, right? Because it's like, yeah. it's often, and that's what I'm finding, like we're doing a lot of work with community health workers at Columbia and, you know, we keep making the argument, we can't sustain this through research grants. Like there has to be an investment in this, right? But we often don't know the return on it. You know, because we don't have the, the long-term research on the impact. So it's a challenge, but I agree. Like, I think like it's a disservice to not have some of those conversations up front. Yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking of one we did in San Diego County. I mean, the sixth largest county in the United States um, where it, from the get-go, even the initial funding, um, which was the United Way, their charge was, we're going to do this, but the child welfare system has to agree to take this over and support it through policy and contracts, mm. right? So there, there was that initial vision of sustainment, which we don't see that often. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see Miranda has a, a hand up here. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. This is my first time engaging with the DISC community and actually I'm very new to implementation science. I'm a PhD candidate at USC. And so just for that background, um, this is all very new to me, but I'm really interested if you have any thoughts on kind of prospectively planning for sustain, sustainment in the context of an intervention that's really based on novel and ever-changing technology. Uh, so. How would that look down the line? I'm, I'm kind of having trouble conceptualizing that given that from now to five years from now, the technology could look drastically different. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's such an important issue. I'm going to put an article. It's Hermes. Um, they look at, Greg, do you know this work where it's like behavioral indicators for digital health and implementation? Um, Hermes, I think it is, 2019. Um, they have kind of proposed what that, what sustain, what all the implementation indicators might look like in the digital context and online context, which is quite different, right? And it is challenging, like even getting my head around what you were just saying, I mean, even implementation, by the time we actually scale study something and then scale it, it's like completely outdated. So sustainability is a whole other entire thing. Um, but, you know, I think one thing with respect to sustainability is that, the extent to which you can embed something in an existing infrastructure that might be more sustained, the better, as opposed to like introducing a new technology or a standoff app or something, right? I think that's like, because hopefully, you know, it would be sustained within that infrastructure. If adaptations happen, it would happen within that context. But that's a really good question. I have not seen much work on that at all. Oh, thank you, Nicole. But you might look at how they're talking about it. I know they propose what would what would indicators look like for sustainability in these in these digital health contexts. Thanks. I'll check it out. Claire, did you have do you want to add? On? Yes. Yes. And then there's a there's also a question in the chat, and I don't want to ignore them too. Um, I was curious because you use the language program throughout, and I'm and I'm just yeah. wondering about like what determines readiness for sustainability like because a lot of the interventions we do don't last for a variety of reasons but maybe they should translate into programs um and so if you have any thoughts about just readiness to be determined for sustainability 
That's so interesting. You know, I've been less on that side of the transition and much more on ones that are already sustained in communities and what can we learn to do that? I don't know, Greg, you've been more in terms of the translational continuum part. I thought it was eye-opening, uh, Lisa Saldana's paper that I posted there. That was the one where they followed it through linearly. And so you saw the ones that didn't even make it through that initial, a lot of the drop-off she said, wasn't necessarily in that sustainment phase. It was in that early um, implementation phase. Like they didn't even get it off the ground kind of thing, right? And I think a lot of work has suggested like a lot of those organizational readiness measures might be good predictors of that. But I don't know if people have looked at that in relation to sustainability too. Do you know, Greg? Um, no, I think Lisa is really doing that. I mean, the ability of the yeah. er early engagement with those six stages to predict you know, whether they implement and whether they sustain is promising way to look at things. And we've been working with Lisa on our last few projects, adapting the SIC for, you know, specific implementation strategies. So how do people think about that in terms of the what's, I wonder if, if there's a distinction between what would, what's ready to be sustained versus what's ready to be implemented. Right. And it's probably like, I mean, usually only those things that it's, it's people think about implementation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking our, our current project, you know, we're engaging policy, organizational executives, MCOs, um, and clinic leaders. And, you know, I'm starting to think we should stage that process. Mm. Like, the first two years or something working with policy and payers, right? Before you even start working with organizations. And it, you know, er Eric has been in the thick of this with me. And um, you know, I think we're we're trying to learn about is there a staging process that we should go through? Because mm -hmm. when we say, you know, what is sustainable, well, it it depends, right? Um, and it depends on ideological priorities and enthusiasm. So, you know, one of our organizations is really focused on this zero suicide initiative. They're doing that at an organizational level, mm -hmm. right? And all the way from the top executive down, it's the mantra of, of what they do. And so we say, well, why can't they be like that with these, you know, CBT and MI, for example? Well, it has to fit the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's a priority and that sort of thing. But and also, I was going to say the sustained tool site, I think the PSAC gets at that a little bit, but it's not so much from the perspective of is the intervention or program ready? It's more like a lot of it is focused on sites, right? Like is a site ready? But that's such a good question to think. I don't think we often think about that way, about it in terms of the intervention itself. I mean, I know Bethany Kwan and others have talked about like, the designing for dissemination notion and sustainability, which might start to get at it. But I think I think we don't usually think about it that way. The policy work is so cool. And I have a, um, a doctoral student who's now out in the world um, as a research associate at NYU. Um, Matthew Lee did his um, dissertation on policy sustainability and adaptation. And he won the DNI like, you know, Innovative Conference Award. And it's such cool work because I, I don't think enough people do work in the space of policy, like you were saying, Greg, and I think like, I think that's a critical area. And it's an area where like, it already happens. And there's so many opportunities to study it. So he did this really cool study where he looked at um, uh, tobacco policies um, in New York City, which, you know, are kind of like thought to be the successful story of, you know, tobacco policy. Um, and he specifically sought to understand um, the extent to which the policy was sustained, adapted, um, and continued, specifically in terms of Asian American inequities, where you know in New York City they're they're huge. Like despite some of the successes, the, um, those were some of the gaps. So he did a lot of work with um, CBOs, kind of like what he called street level um, bureaucrats and like policy on the on the street um, policymakers in terms of like actually delivering the policy through departments of health. Um, and did work with um, kind of state level policymakers to understand some of those notions of sustainability and adaptation for existing policies. So um, I think that area is fascinating and, and really understudied and hopefully he'll publish it soon. <laughs> but his work is great if you're interested. Mm.
Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Dr. Shelton, do you have a couple extra minutes? There's one other question in the chat. Of course, of was... course. I lost complete track of the chat. So if there were questions, definitely anyone unmute themselves here. Um, so Hannah asked about existing measures of sustainment to assess sustainment dynamically over time. So a lot of measures may focus more on sustainment at a point in time. How yeah. can we ensure that measures of sustainment are capturing the nuances of intervention delivery over time? And do you mean that as in terms of the determinants and predictors or more sustain? Some people say talk about like sustainment as an outcome. Do you mean more like the, the outcome over time dynamically? Yeah, sorry, I'm in the car, so I don't know how well you can hear me. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I mean more as sustainment being the outcome, though I'm certainly curious on your thoughts on either, but more the. Yeah, the it's so hard because it has to have that time period aspect, right? But you don't want to just get it at one window um, or have huge gaps. So the way we have done that is to look at it annually, for example, um, in terms of, you know, continued delivery of number of programs or continued impact, we might look at it annually over a period of time. So in our study, we're doing it for four years. And so based on that, plus some of that historical data, we're able to kind of make an <laughs> an assessment of of what which are which are sustained which are moderately sustained um, and which are less so i think that's often how you see it is that people might assess it the same indicators on kind of a, a regular basis um, and make a determination about overall sustainability it's tough to do it kind of one one window in time but i haven't seen it where one measure um leads you to do that it's more like you might have to ask it at multiple periods do you know of any uh, is anyone else know of any I, i'm not i'm not familiar with any yeah and i think it's more using a similar measure over multiple time points or whatever your oh. sustainment time window is and that's a challenge i see eric has a question too i want to answer but i but i didn't say this but um one thing that is a challenge, just like with fidelity, is it's hard to have a gold standard, right? It's hard to have a one size fits all measure. And so in some cases, like it, it can be hard to be comparable because sometimes people are looking at continued delivery of the program and the extent to which it's delivered. And it's more like um, it's more specific to the program, right, or the intervention. Um, so that's another challenge. There's not many overall measures besides press and I guess stages of the the sick as well. Um, Thank you. Of course. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Um, and I see Erica thinking about what happens if systems leader policymakers are invested in sustainment, but providers and organizations are not there yet. Interesting. I would hope that they that would be the dream, right? That we'd get the policymakers on board first, and then it would come. Um, that's a good question. I don't know of examples where that's happened, but I imagine that that would be a good situation if they're able to provide like the support and the training and the resources then at the organizational level to get them on board. You know, just like we see where people influence implementation through like network norms in terms of this clinic's doing this or this school is doing that. Um, or thinking about maybe there's metrics that might incentivize the providers to do that. So I think, you know, a lot of the literature we have on implementation and getting them on board on that might be relevant there as well. Well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Shelton, for being with us. This has been so much fun uh, for us research nerds, but yes. um, <laughs> for me too. Yeah. Just really enjoyed it and really thought provoking and and uh, and I think points out some opportunities for people to pursue in this area. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me and and feel free. I'll put my um I'll put my email here. I'm happy to send slides and if you have um, follow up questions, I love this area. Always happy to chat. So thanks for having me. Great. Thank you so much and thank you everybody who attended. We got got a few hangers on here, but. Um, we had really good attendance, um, so. That's great. So thanks so much. Okay. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.